this isn't your typical Star Wars story. It's not exclusively a story of the light and dark sides of the Force in pitched combat. It's also a story that examines the ways we define morals, redemption, and self-sacrifice. It sees the binary of the light and dark sides of the Force, but challenges you to think deeply about what that looks like. This video isn't a plot synopsis. We're looking at the way the Knights of the Old Republic series codified the heart of Star Wars. KOTOR discusses trauma, how one could lose their religion, the practical and deeply personal costs of war. It even asks you at what point does adherence to a perceived moral good become a new form of dogmatic nature. It proposes the ethical conclusions one may arrive to when observing the light and dark, and contrasts it with a commentary on master-slave morality. The Jedi supposedly embody the highest values of balance in the Force. But KOTOR challenges fans to consider the value of the codified, regimented nature of the Jedi Order. What happens when somebody tries to reject this dichotomy? Not the hopeful story you might be looking for. There's no reconciliation with true evil. But we must acknowledge some cold, bitter truths about human nature, about the dark places we can take spiritual ends even if they are done from a priestly mode of valuation. Because Knights of the Old Republic is a critique. It's an examination of what people can do when they apply their dogmatic ideas of what is right and wrong in an unserious and intellectually dishonest way. It dares you to look straight into the eyes of what is truly remarkably, quintessentially evil. To truly understand what embodies the dark side. This is the grim philosophy of KOTOR. The hottest ticket in town. Advance tickets for the new Star Wars film went on sale this afternoon. Star Wars was introduced to a new generation with the prequel trilogy, during and right after the dot-com boom of 1999 to 2005. And 2003 is where we see the dawn of the focal point of our video. You see, old George was a very savvy businessman. So Bioware would set up a new game thousands of years before the events of the original movies. And basically, it was an alternate Star Wars. In a sense, Bioware put together their attempt at an interactive Star Wars D&D campaign. It's over two decades old and still holds up, at least in scope and depth of its compelling narrative, worlds, and diverse characters, with unique backstories, personalities, and arcs. So our game is going to be a party-based game. You'll be able to control up to three characters at any given time. Your interactions could influence their relationships and the outcome of the story. The alignment system allowed you to make choices along the light and dark sides of the Force, giving a significant amount of replayability and depth to your interaction with the game. The game is still famous for its remarkable twist towards the end, where the player character, you, are revealed to be a former Sith Lord, Revan. The narrative used an amnesia trope to provide shock and also integrate your choices into the identity of the game world. It blended narrative with gameplay mechanics, making you feel like your choices had deep and involved integration into the actual game world. Everything you had done in the game had led up to this point. The game did remarkably well, and a sequel was released in 2004. But this game sought to take the Star Wars narrative in a particularly important direction. You see, KOTOR's alignment system, this mechanical qualification of light and dark, wasn't just a game mechanic. It had to mean something. It had to contribute something to the lore of the canon of Star Wars. So compared to the Titan, George Lucas's company, Lucasfilm Limited, 
hot off of a whole new trilogy of Star Wars movies, the developers of this next game, Obsidian Entertainment, just got done learning how to walk. The company just opened its doors a year prior. So yeah, don't screw it up. The tones of the games are well embodied by the box art. The first game promises to excite you with daring and dashing adventure through deep space, encountering a menacing dastardly villain, a poised resolute battle maiden demands your presence to arms, new life forms, and a grand interstellar opera as the backdrop. KOTOR 2 The Sith Lords already looks much more foreboding than the previous one. An ominous, rave-like mask sits in the center, set against a planet aflame. Light and dark clash in the center, and a man with cracked, almost mineral-looking skin, crimson saber drawn, looks right at you. We know of the power and the capabilities of the Empire, with the evil Sith Emperor commanding Darth Vader from the previous movies, but his power is largely based in modern, mechanical, and political constructions. Much like the common stereotypes of the Nazi party's war machine, the Empire is embodied by armor, ships, guns, and lots of them. The Sith are something a bit more sinister, something more ethereal, supernatural in a macabre, ghostly kind of way. What does the dark side look like when its power is more than just cogs and wheels? And how can it frighten a fully developed republic? Why would somebody sacrifice their body to this point for this kind of power? The power of the dark side is what holds me together. Many times have I been near death, and always have I been in pain. I fear no one, for while the force is with me, I yet live. We even see our hero of the second game, the Exile, would lose their powers on purpose through losing their spirituality. Unlike the Sith who writhe and fester in it. The dichotomy of light and dark is an important component of the Star Wars universe. While one can be forgiven for thinking of it as a spectrum, as we see light in reality as a spectrum, it's not like that. There are rules. We see them play out time and time again. And good intentions aren't enough to overcome those rules. Try to bend the dark side to your will, and it will consume you, as it did Revan, as it did Malak, and supposedly, the man that Darth Nihilus once was. He sees planets, stars, not people. To him, the planet below, with its teeming life, only that is massive enough to demand his attention. Darth Sion keeps his effectively dead body together with the power of the dark side. Darth Treya is cunning and conniving. Darth Malak is an intimidating martial commander with a powerful army at his beck and call. And Revan was a fearful, adept swordsman and force user. But Darth Nihilus resembles a dark apparition more than a human. Something akin to Sauron. And the reason he is the way he is speaks to some profoundly disturbing observations about the lengths the human psyche can go to to preserve itself. The main point to understand is that these stories are hugely intertwined into the practical and deeply personal costs of war. Nihilus is a victim of a weapon of mass destruction detonated at the climax of a major war prior to the narrative of both of these games, the mass shadow generator at Malachor V. Revan and the Exile, commanders at the time, are responsible for its usage and bear the mental burden of their decision. But Nihilus is reduced to a force siphoning husk during this battle to sustain himself. There is a cost to all war, even the ones that are waged supposedly for good reasons, because there is no war without a cost. War inflicts trauma and can make you question your belief set. It can even explain how one could lose their religion. KOTOR does not shy away from the rigor of war. It takes it very, very seriously, 
and contextualizes the legend of a culture in Star Wars that takes it seriously themselves. Prior to the events of the first game, territories in the Outer Rim were invaded by the Mandalorians, a clan-based culture bound by a code of honor in the ability to wage war. Eventually, they reached their way towards Republic territory and began wreaking havoc, prompting the Galactic Republic to mount an armed response. But the Jedi did not intervene. This is a different mode of behavior we're expected to seeing from the Jedi Order. We see the Jedi at the forefront of the war with the Separatists, as strategically impactful operatives managing the tactical maneuvering of the Republic's clones. Here we see them do nothing. The Mandalorians invade Cathar, bringing its native species to near extinction. Eventually our main character of the first game, Revan, breaks rank with a group of Jedi who seek to intervene and stop the onslaught and the Council reluctantly gives him and his fellow Jedi warriors accompanying him a seal of approval. Now, Revan and Malak efficiently dismantle the Mandalorian attack with their inherent skill and prowess as warriors, and following the war, they venture into deep space to find what caused them to go to war in the first place. But they come back as warlords, commanders of a new evil Sith empire. What happened to these virtuous fighters? Real-world philosophy might give us some clues that exist outside of the way we conceptualize it in writing. A philosopher who spoke quite candidly about these phenomenon was Friedrich Nietzsche. Those familiar with his work will have noticed my phrasing at the beginning of the video, and you'll hear more from him throughout the entire course of it. Nietzsche is often associated with the popularization of the word nihilism. The word shares a branch with the Latin root word nihil, meaning nothing. This word is also used to refer to the main antagonist pirate raider faction in the High Republic timeline, which is set between the events of KOTOR and the main movies. Nietzsche thought he was simply observing nihilism. He did not consider himself a nihilist. He saw nihilism as a consequence of the death of God the decline of religious and moral absolutes in the modern age, making it more difficult for people to ascertain right and wrong. This led to a sociological power vacuum in the human experience that could have disastrous consequences, or so he stipulated. He proposed that individuals had a unique way of demarcating this dichotomy between right and wrong, and that the etymology mattered because masters and slaves had different ideas about what was good. He wrote of this in Genealogy of Morals, explaining the valuation methods these individuals used, and the classes they were commonly associated with therein. In this one writing of many, Nietzsche describes a fundamental dichotomy in the values and moral systems of different societies and individuals. Master, slave, morality. The dichotomy is distinguished by their modes of moral valuation. Master morality originates from the knightly and aristocratic mode of valuation, those who see themselves as superior, powerful, and noble. In this moral framework, values are not based on universal principles, but rather on a sense of pride and personal distinction. The good in master morality is associated with strength, nobility, wealth, and power. It celebrates life, health, and what Nietzsche sees as the natural instincts of humanity. Conversely, the bad is associated with the weak, the poor, the sick, those qualities and people that the masters see as inferior, without necessarily attributing any moral failing. Slave morality, on the other hand, emerges from the oppressed, the weak, and the marginalized, this embodies the priestly mode of valuation. It is essentially a reaction to the dominance of master morality. In this moral scheme, good is defined as the qualities that the oppressed possess, 
such as humility, empathy, and patience, virtues born out of necessity. Not that the peace they brought lasted very long. The Jedi left. The people grew complacent. Those who had been wronged saw their chance at revenge. And so the cycle continues. The oppressed become the new generation of oppressors. The human oppressed, that is. The non-humans were never treated well in any case. We felt the brunt of both administrations. The evil is seen in the characteristics of the oppressors, equating strength and power with wickedness and immorality. Slave morality is thus characterized by a sense of resentment towards the masters, leading to a moral system that values the opposite of what master morality values. When the Mandalorian Wars break out, Revan and Malak are outraged by the perceived inaction of the Jedi Council. They see them sitting around as morally egregious. From their priestly mode of valuation, they perceive the Mandalorian attack as abuse of the powerless, and they are reacting to what they perceive as evil. Letting evil commit evil is evil. But the Jedi Council is consciously within their framework of the priestly mode of valuation as well. They believe that it is not worth hastily running into war, that patience is more important at this time. At the time, fighting seems like the right thing to do. The Mandalorians are rolling through planets with no effective resistance. Isn't not using your power to stop them an ethical fault? Or is using your power because you have more of it a problem in and of itself? Revan and his fellow rogue Jedi get what they want. They defeat the Mandalorians, but in order to, supposedly, prevent this kind of war from happening again, Revan and Malak become the very things they swore to destroy. Doing something because it is good, because it's in response to evil, can sometimes make people do evil themselves. Sometimes people will fall so deep into their reactive ways that any reaction of any kind, of any proportion, is inherently good. When the war concludes, the Jedi General Mitra Surik comes back to face trial by the Jedi Council for brazenly going off to war without their approval, and she's cut off from the Order. She walks away and cuts herself off from the Force. But why does she do this? She did see up close and personal what happens when people use the Force at mass scale, even if it's done for the quote-unquote right reason. She observes a planet that was described as a place fueled by war. The nightly mode of valuation determines good and low or vulgar, and the priestly mode determines good and evil. But these are the ways humans have figured out moral questions, at least to a point. What if the nature of something doesn't fall within this binary? Nietzsche explains this by making an analogy between birds of prey and lambs. Of course, the lambs will resent the birds of prey. But the birds of prey are predators. Of course they will eat the lambs. If something exists to consume, what is the cost of mistakenly identifying it as evil? Dark side users aren't the nicest of individuals, but the Jedi Order does not avoid criticism throughout the course of Knights of the Old Republic and many Star Wars movies. The term Jedi Knight is interesting when you contextualize it with aristocratic and superior tone. Of course they'd fit the bill for master morality, but they're also a spiritual, priestly order. So are they using both of these modes of valuation at the same time? Well, it's important to contextualize the way that they approach the world. But we have to look at their greatest opposition, the Sith. The Sith who embody good versus bad. Bad in the sense of describing disgust. Towards the end of the first game, Malak confronts the unbeknownst Revan along with his companions and tells him the truth. He is not a mere Republic soldier turned Jedi. He is the former Dark Lord of the Sith. You cannot hide from what you once were, Revan. Recognize that you were once the Dark Lord and know that I have taken your place. I was part of the team sent to capture Revan to capture you. When Malak fired on the ship, you were badly injured. We thought you were dead. Your mind was destroyed, but I used the Force to preserve the flicker of life in your body. 
I brought you to the Jedi Council. They were the ones who healed your damaged mind. The Jedi Council didn't restore your wounded mind, Revan. They merely programmed it with a new identity, one loyal to the Republic. They tried to make you their slave. The Jedi's slave. Slave. This is stated with the implication that his decisions are not his own as a consequence of having his mind wiped. Revan had an entire nation-crushing army under his direct command. Malak's usage of the word slave connotates the notion that Revan's own ideas that he naturally arrived to were wiped, reprogramming him into a figure of service and humility, as opposed to one of power. He's essentially saying the Jedi turned Revan from a powerful warrior to a weak servant. When Bastila, the Jedi primarily responsible for preserving Revan, asks for his forgiveness concerning the whole process of essentially using him as a means to find an ancient dark side superweapon before Malak's Sith can, Revan forgives her and Malak derides him. Forgiveness, Revan. You are weak. I was right to betray you. You are not fit to rule the Sith. Forgiveness is a concept commonly associated with the priestly mode of valuation. Among forgiveness, other virtues like humility, obedience, and piety are important cornerstones, not just of a guy with a funny mustache a hundred years ago, but the values of the way of life for the Jedi. Here's the Jedi Code. There is no emotion. There is peace. There is no ignorance. There is knowledge. There is no passion. There is serenity. There is no chaos. There is harmony. There is no death. There is the Force. So why is this important? Well, Malak is a dark lord. He only sees things in power differentials. What code does he follow? The Sith Code. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. The Force shall free me. Peace is a lie is an important component of all of this. The dark side exists not because of the light and dark side naturally being together like yin and yang. That's not what this is. When one talks of balance in the Force, there's only one option, the light. Peace is a lie implies that the dark side always needs some kind of fuel for its fire. The dark side is a co-opting of the Force, taking the Force, internalizing it, and using it to selfish ends you become more important than the Force. When one says they serve the light, they're serving the Force. There's an inherent sacrifice of self, an idea that your life is not your own. The dark side is a deliberate attempt to swim against that current, and it warps and distorts those who steep themselves in it. Immersion in the dark side has physically observable effects on you and your party members. Sith practitioners see this as a sort of no pain, no gain kind of thing. After all, Darth Sion literally wears the title, the Dark Lord of Pain. So knowing all of this, the Dark Force user simply says, I want power, and I'm going to get it. There is the good of defeating enemies, and the bad of losing. The knightly and aristocratic mode of valuation values qualities that are appreciated for their inherent power, vitality, and superiority, like the dark side. Now, this isn't to make a direct one-to-one -one comparison and say the dark side is master morality and the light side is slave morality. It's not like that. It's not that one is good or one is bad. They're just natural ways in which people sort of maneuver the world. The priestly mode of valuation values qualities wherein one is focusing on the spiritual and the internal as a response to external oppression. There is the good of defending the defenseless, and the evil of raising arms for the sake of it. So Revan can't be all that weak, because Revan defeats Malak. And Malak initially can't believe it. It's only with his dying words when he recognizes there was power in the light. Only as he dies in battle does he finally understand. Impossible. I... I... Cannot be beaten. I am the Dark Lord of the Sith. Maybe there is more truth in their code than I ever believed. And in the end, as the darkness takes me, I am nothing.
So did Revan win because he was a goody two shoes? He was a bad guy. Now he's a good guy and we did it. Well, it's not that cut and dry because the ethics of what the Jedi do with him are questioned, even if Revan was redeemed. Was it a truly fair redemption? Revan was not redeemed of his own desires. He exists in relation to the Jedi's moral framework. And at this point, is this Revan really Revan? Did the Jedi break their own rules? In their travels, this is what Bastila, the Jedi who encounters Revan in combat, says to him. What greater weapon is there than to turn an enemy to your cause, to use their own knowledge against them? This is an interesting take from the Jedi Order because it doesn't sound like them. It sounds opportunistic. It sounds a bit conniving. What Bastila is implying is true. There is value in using the knowledge of the enemy. This is a pragmatic, strategic decision, not a humanitarian one, at least up until this point, not until Bastila reveals her love for Revan. Is it clear that there was another angle here? The dark side has not wholly consumed me. I cannot raise my blade against you. You will go on to defeat Malak. Of this I have little doubt. He will have gone from being the Sith Lord himself to the savior of our galaxy. And you said you loved me. This may not be the best time to say it, but I love you too, with all my heart. So we have a common theme. Bastila tends to a redeemed Revan, whose curiosity caused him to fall to the dark side. And Bastila falls to the dark side as well, to be redeemed by the man she saved. Why is this important? Because it implies that the Jedi Order gets something really, really important wrong. The human level. Because the Jedi Order does not allow attachment or possession. Compassion, of course, but romantic love is antithetical to the way the Jedi live. Did it stop Jedi from falling in love? No, of course it didn't. And the way the Jedi frame it is interesting. One Jedi Knight from the High Republic states, experiencing and embracing joy, affection, even grief, was part of the light side. However, a Jedi couldn't be a slave to these emotions. Slave. That's interesting. One Jedi notes being a slave to joy and affection and grief as unbecoming. And a Dark Lord notes being a slave of the Jedi of a spiritual system as unbecoming. But we know someone who fell to the dark side who categorized things by good and evil, not good and bad. Anakin, Chancellor Palpatine is evil. From my point of view, the Jedi are evil. Well, then you are lost. And now you may see what I mean. The light and dark side are inherently incompatible, yes. Master and slave morality are inherently incompatible, yes. But people, individuals are not binary. Individuals are a spectrum. Individuals have unquantifiable points of rationale for doing the things that they do. What makes the dark side so pernicious and what makes it so effective at turning people is that it validates you. It makes you feel special. Love Conquers All is a hugely important theme to Knights of the Old Republic, and that alone makes the game's critique of the Jedi Order pretty strong, particularly when they create the conditions necessary for contempt. When listening to Nietzsche for the first time, it may be easy to frame master and slave morality as wrong and right, but this is truly just one of those things where looking at something on the surface is just not good enough. Going a bit deeper is necessary to truly appreciate it. Nietzsche doesn't say the knight is wrong, and the priest can do no wrong. He's not even saying the inverse of that. He's saying both of these people have the propensity to do heinous things based on the context. Contempt was used by masters to maintain a sense of superiority over the less worthy. Those in turn would hold contempt for their masters, seeing them as brutish and cruel. Something else to note is that contempt in both of these cases can be so strong to a point where it puts an intellectual distance between the individual and the thing that they are critiquing. And at a certain point, they refuse to understand it and can no longer identify it. In the case of Revan, after the trauma of the Mandalorian War, he dives into his spirituality or his interpretation of how the Force should be used to justify his purpose. The Mandalorians are waging war, and as Jedi, he must use his power to combat them. But after all of this, he seeks to destroy the Republic for its weakness, a sort of power Darwinism to make way for the more worthy Sith Empire. Nietzsche says, to demand of strength that it should not express itself as strength, 
but it should not be a wish to overpower, a wish to conquer, a wish to become master, a lust for enemies, resistance and triumphs, is just as absurd as to require of weakness that it should express itself as strength. Revan may be a slave to his passions, but the Jedi Order is a slave to ideological purity. This isn't because the Jedi Order and Revan are stupid. People need purpose, and without it they will desire oblivion, rather than have no purpose. Nietzsche talks of this in regards to ascetic religious figures who will starve themselves to become closer to divine wisdom. The Christian practice of fasting is a form of asceticism. The way the Jedi renounce love and attachment is also a form of asceticism. This behavior, when followed to an extreme conclusion, particularly if it's channeled in the wrong direction, can have disastrous consequences. Certainly he has also dared, innovated, braved more, and challenged fate more than all the other animals put together. He the great experimenter, the unsatisfied, the insatiable, who struggles for supreme mastery against the beasts, nature, and the gods he never conquered, always looking towards the future. He who finds no longer any rest from his own aggressive strength, goaded inexorably on by the spur of the future, dug into the flesh of the present. How should so brave and rich an animal not also be the most endangered, the most chronically ill, the most seriously ill animal of all. KOTOR, and particularly the second game, makes a call for us to recognize the limitations of any system of thought, scientific or religious, that purports to offer a comprehensive account of the human experience while ignoring its complexity and depth. Mitra understands that leaning into the Force with that mode of spiritual thinking, clouded by negative emotions, is dangerous. So she cuts herself off from her own faith, to keep herself from using it to justify what she's done. But her empathetic nature gives her an opportunity to come back to it, and while the Jedi Order attempts to separate her connection from the Force, for the very possibility that she may fall to the dark side and turn her friends to the dark side too, she ultimately rebukes that rigidity by aligning herself with the Force in a way that's more holistic than the Jedi Masters do. When Kreia confronts the Jedi Order towards the beginning of KOTOR 2's final act, as Mitra is tried for the second time, Kreia angrily cuts off the other Jedi Masters' connections to the Force. They die on the spot, not from a spell like lightning, they die from the shock of being cut off from the Force, as opposed to Mitra who cut herself off from the Force and was still a person. She was still... Mitra Surik. The Mandalorian Wars were a series of massacres that masked another war, a war of conversion, culminating in a final atrocity that no Jedi could walk away from, save one. And that is what I sought to understand how one could turn away from such power, give up the Force, and still live. But I see what happened now. It is because you were afraid. When you unfairly frame everything opposed to your point of view as evil, or in the league of evil, however unwittingly, you end up becoming a slave to your own moral rigidity. You become contemptuous. Compared to the way evil is personified in the sequel trilogy, the Sith Empire doesn't appear to be much more theatrical and intimidating for the purpose of dramatic effect than the First Order. But there's an important part about what makes the Sith Empire work, in my opinion, and the First Order feel a bit more plastic. The Sith Empire feels real. The arrogance of its vanguards feels compelling. The Sith Empire can be compared to the Empire of the original trilogy, but there's something about them that looks and feels a bit different. Their armor is ornate and glistening with notes of variation. Bright, glossy silver combined with matte black creates notes of contrast, both in finish and in color. The face is concealed by a shimmering, noticeable dark gold plate. The officers' uniforms are, of course, carried over in inspiration from the original movies, too, but there's a bit of a twist on the design. The Empire's dress uniforms are utilitarian, with straight lines, a clean and anonymous look, a regimented, machine-like stature. But the soldiers of the Sith Empire almost look like they're having a little bit of fun with it. They're showy, they have ornamental detail, elaborate designs, visible seams and panels and those killer jackboots, of course. We learn a lot about why the Sith are the way they are throughout the course of the two games. We learn they approach it from an assessment of what they think is good, that is, 
order, supposedly a better system of governance for the whole galaxy. We hear the same thing from the Empire of the more modern Star Wars timeline. But we don't get an idea of why the First Order exists other than we needed to make a Star Wars movie. Comparably, the First Order feels like space fascism put into an AI art generator. Its power and scale are so comically large that on practical levels, you need an equally comically large response to it to match its power. Before Starkiller Base wipes out an entire star system, we get a well-acted speech on how the weaker nations of the puny good guys will bow to the strong and really cool bad guys. But when the Sith Empire is revealed in KOTOR, they don't announce themselves. They just appear. Compare the screaming space Nazi speech of the First Order to Malik's command to his most trusted admiral. You summoned me, Lord Malik. The search for Bastila is taking too long. We cannot risk her escaping Taris. Destroy the entire planet. The, the entire planet, Lord Malik? Your predecessor once made the mistake of questioning my orders, Admiral. Surely you are not so foolish as to make the same mistake. Of, of course not, my Lord Malik. The First Order is bad because the bad guys are bad. The Sith Empire is bad because they are operating on a moral framework that holds the individuals that don't agree with their way of governing the world in contempt for being lesser, stupid, weak. They hold the weaker powers of the galaxy in contempt. They're disgusted by weakness. Revan falls to this mode of thinking because in his own weird, twisted way, he believes he is saving the Republic from itself by forcing it into conflict and to destroy that weakness it encompasses, at least according to him. That is how the Sith operate. That's why Malak fires on Revan's ship. It is a tenuous relationship of power dynamics where allies are exclusively, utterly, only based on selfish, immediate, short-sighted grounds. The Starscream effect. The second-in-command gunning for the position of the Alpha. When you consider the concept of the Alpha Wolf being a phenomenon observed of wolves in captivity, not in the wild, it seems to contextualize the dark side a lot more, trapped in a cage of their own destructive tendencies. In the wild, wolves are social creatures. What makes you survive in a prison and what makes you survive in the wilderness are not the same thing. Dark side users are not masters. They are not masters of their own destiny. They think they are because it gives them short-term victories, short-term battles to the next short-term battles. Dark side users are unwitting participants in a cycle of death and destruction. They are slaves to a self-consuming ideology. I was cast down, stripped of my power, exiled. The characterization of Darth Nihilus as the Dark Lord of Hunger is important. Power as consuming, hunger. Hunger implies the necessity of sustaining, to sate. The reason the dark side is a perversion of the Force is because the Force just is. Fire doesn't exist without a fuel source. With no fuel source, the fire dies. In the same way, committing heinous acts in the name of a faith is a different fuel source for wicked ends, even if the person participating in this behavior thinks it is good. Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, is an important, almost Shakespearean tragedy of sorts, in the sense that it is a very necessary story to showcase how ignoring your psychological and emotional needs as a person can have dangerous effects and cause individuals to seek that fire as a means to fulfill purpose. It makes things like the dark side and fascism more palpable to people. It details Anakin's fall to the dark side and his newfound identity as Darth Vader. The rigidity and stubbornness of the Jedi Order is examined without completely absolving Anakin of responsibility. It gives the light side credence while not completely ignoring the realities of why Anakin fell. 
When Anakin is confronted with a vision of his wife Padme perishing in childbirth, he seeks to prevent it from happening. He reaches out to Master Yoda for advice, who states that death is a natural part of life. When Anakin states that he will stop it from happening, Yoda responds. Miss them, do not. Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. Yoda is correct in this statement. It's unreasonable of Anakin to attempt the prevention of death, but the way in which Yoda approaches the topic puts a sour taste in Anakin's mouth. It may be easy to say this for Yoda, and he's coming from a place of good intent, but he directly states not to mourn, not to miss loved ones. This is not just an unreasonable expectation of a Jedi Knight, it's an unreasonable expectation of anyone. A Jedi Knight is a human being, and just like death is a natural part of life, so is grief and mourning in the face of loss. Demanding an abstinence from this is not reasonable. Yoda is essentially demanding that Anakin suppress one mode of his morality here with a sort of slave morality that forces him to bottle up his emotions in an unhealthy way, leading to resentment. This approach is heavily criticized in Nietzsche's genealogy of morals. Nietzsche doesn't let the priestly caste, as he puts it, get off scot-free because they have the right intentions. In fact, he thinks that if anything, the mental get out of jail free card of labeling everything against your code as evil can have the same effect as being a tyrant. Anakin's transformation into Darth Vader is thus not merely a personal failing, but a tragic outcome of systemic rigidity and an uncritical adherence to a moral doctrine that negates the full spectrum spectrum of human emotional experience. His turn to the dark side, propelled by resentment, becomes a poignant critique of the Jedi Order's philosophy, as well as a reflection on the broader dangers of moral absolutism. The Jedi Order creates its own unique set of problems, either in the form of disillusioned users of the dark side, or rogue force users, who are chastised by the Jedi Order for not being pious enough. The black pill of Star Wars is that the Jedi Order kinda sucks. The priestly class unwittingly becomes the new master and creates a new reactionary response. The reason Star Wars emphasizes this system of echoes is because it is a commentary on the nature of clashing ideas, not always necessarily just to make a new movie, although that is really convenient. There's always going to be somebody who feels like the underdog and somebody who feels like they need to be in charge, either because it's logically correct or morally correct. It all depends on the individual. But what I think makes KOTOR 2 such a compelling story is the relatively happy ending it implies in response to this, the implication that it is possible to approach faith in an earnest way. And that's done through the story of my favorite Star Wars character, the Exile. The most direct way to look at the Exile's ousting from the Jedi Order is essentially the idea that she was not, and everyone else who followed Revan was not pious enough. This was an ideological purity test. But what makes her story unique is that she is the one who comes back to the council to face trial, while the rest of Revan and his followers venture into deep space and come back as warriors acting on behalf of the dark side. Mitra tries to do the right thing and go for the system, knowing that the Jedi will not give her points for that. Malachor V is depicted as a seriously traumatizing event. The exact figures of how many Republic and Mandalorian troops died is kept purposefully vague. But if we look at the wreckage of the planet, we can fill in the blank. Just compare it to warships you know of in reality. All these warships crewed thousands of personnel, and these are just the graveyards in orbit. We see the end point of what was essentially a massive gravity bomb that wiped out the entire planet and all of the warships fighting in this massive orbital naval battle. One of the party members you encounter in the game, Beodur, recognizes the exile from the war because at the time he called her general. There were no more Mandalorians left to die. I remember standing on the bridge with you and watching the destruction of the Republic, watching ships full of soldiers and Jedi burn and die. I remember the look you had when you turned to me. It was the longest you'd ever looked at me. You didn't say anything, just a nod. Events moved quickly then, even in my dreams. Flashes, explosions, you falling. I could feel the pain around me. And then the memory. The drifting hulks of the Mandalorian ships, the dead, allies, friends, strangers. And then the echo, lingering. The sound I awakened to in my nightmares. It was nothing more than a slaughter. A slaughter caused by one of my creations. Blame lies with me for creating it. The situation forced your hand. 
anger forced mine. He realized that unless action was taken, the fleet would be destroyed and the Republic would fall. None of us realized the magnitude of what we unleashed. Malachor V creates a wound in the Force from the sudden and destructive nature of it causing so many casualties so quickly. Echoes of war echo throughout the plot of this game. Revan, Malak, and the Exile went to fight in the wars at the behest of the Jedi Order. They're directly responsible for the events at Malachor V, and only one Jedi takes accountability. Only one. She's punished for it. Master Atrus invokes this battle to Mitra to essentially say, you reap what you sow. We have not lost a Jedi this day. You felt it. She has lost herself. She is no Jedi. She walked Revan's path, but she was not strong enough. Why does Atrus feel this way about the exile? It's because where some warriors that followed Revan steeped themselves in the fighting and the sensation of it to numb the pain, the exile makes a concerted effort to cut herself off from it. She's traumatized. And Atrus, in a sense, interprets that as blasphemous. This contempt and bitterness eats away at Atrus too, and she falls to the dark side, dueling with Mitra towards the end of the game. When we circle these concepts back to the real world, we can see quite clearly that in many cases, people use faith to do heinous things. And we know that the people that are usually the first to cast blame, to angrily cast blame, to angrily cast the first stone, have something to hide. There's an implication that is left in the air that doesn't totally absolve Revan and his followers. It is implied that the Jedi Order was slow and indecisive on the Mandalorian threat, but it also implies that much of what motivated Revan was passion. And a passionate war is still a war. Revan's contempt for the Mandalorians and his eagerness to go to war is motivated by understandable things. He finds evidence of a genocide committed by the Mandalorians. Still, what we get is essentially a cautionary tale of eagerness to go to war. In my opinion, the stress Revan and the Exile go through are meant as vehicles to examine the different ways people respond to trauma. More specifically, trauma of war, and posit that it is possible to transcend the trauma, transcending the cyclical, never-ending storm of master and slave morality, and the conflicts therein. Not because of some deliberate effort to be edgy or smart, but by using self-introspection. You may think that the Jedi Order is primarily focused on the difference between good and evil. Like anything, there is a difference between practice and preaching. At many points, their behavior seems to be more of a focus on good and bad. There's a certain superiority complex to them, an air of virtuosity that justifies all of their decision making. This is not good enough for a passionate man like Revan. This is not good enough for a passionate man like Anakin. They need better explanations than that. Revan is a sort of force-wielding ubermensch who attempts to transcend the typical dichotomy of the light and the dark side, but he looks into the abyss and the abyss looks back at him. I think Revan is just one way of analyzing the ubermensch. The point of the story isn't to say you can be better than the Force and use both sides. An important mechanic of the game is how your decision making has a very direct effect on your Force powers. The higher your alignment with the light, the less effort you expend to use powers of the light. These powers are what you typically find with classes like paladins, clerics, or priests in typical fantasy RPGs. Healing, curing illness, defensive spells, protection from dark powers, defensive powers, reactive powers. Alignment with the dark makes your dark side powers less exerting. And as you may guess, those powers are almost exclusively offensive powers to participate in combat with, like lightning or panic-inducing spells, things that a witch or a warlock would use. You gain or lose alignments depending on your behavior. If you do something cruel, you gain affinity for the dark. If you do something that is compassionate, you gain affinity for the light. The game doesn't encourage you to do one thing or the other per se, but it does incentivize you to pick a side. It asks you to weigh your actions in the context of the battles you will face ahead. It holds you accountable for your decisions. You will not get brownie points for being in the middle. It just makes light and dark side powers cost more. We see people in reality use this way of thinking as a critique all the time. You may hear people use the phrase, both sidesism. The Jedi, the Sith, you don't get it, do you? To the galaxy, they're the same thing. Just men and women with too much power, squabbling over religion while the rest of us burn. At least the Sith are honest about what they're killing for. The Jedi are pacifists, except in times of war. They're teachers, except when it comes to telling their students the truth. We actually see this argument play out among Star Wars fans. That's how deep this stuff goes. For example, 
Ahsoka is often cited as an example of a gray Jedi, which is often countered by the argument that there's no such thing. There's no balance between light and dark. Ahsoka still embodies wielding the power of the light side. There's no gray side. You cannot have it both ways. You can't have your force lightning and force heal too. However, there are angles of both of these arguments that are not irrelevant. The very fact that Ahsoka is operating outside of the Jedi Order at all is important because it implies a separation from the Jedi Order's mode of valuation. Ahsoka and the Exile are not forsaking the light. They're just rogue force users. They're not rejecting the light and trying to have it both ways. They just have a different idea of what spirituality means. Aren't we all rogue force users? In the Star Wars universe, you'd be a rogue force user because everyone has the force flowing through them. The force binds all living things. We all have moral codes we use in our daily lives. We may not assign labels to them or codifications, but we use them all the time. Mitra's compassion and capacity to forgive in the end is what ends up being her strength. Strength in numbers is what allows her to defeat the most destructive villains imaginable, including Darth Nihilus, who's the only Sith Lord in both games that requires you to fight him with a party. When Mitra's pilot, Atten, explains to her that he fought for the Sith at one point and made a good living off of killing Jedi, he laments his past and admits that a big chunk of why he's here is to try to make good. Instead of condemning him, Mitra forgives him and trains him in the ways of the Force. And she sacrificed herself to keep my secret, to prevent the Sith from knowing about that touch of the Force inside me. She wasted her life to save me, me. And I felt her die when she opened her mind. I've killed Jedi, like I said, but I was never there to feel it to be on the receiving end. And after that, I couldn't stop feeling things. Before, guilt, lust, impatience. It had been orchestrated to get close. Now it all just kept tumbling out, and I couldn't keep doing what I was doing. So I left. I fled with the displaced war veterans to Nar Shaddaa and I lost myself there, until the war came to an end. I wanted no more of Jedi, or Dark Jedi, or the Force. I just wanted to be left alone. And then, I met you on Paragus. And I thought maybe, maybe she had saved me so that I could help you. And if I can't, then I have to try. I didn't want to tell you any of this, but I had to. Because if something happens, I can't let you think I was doing it for something other than the past. I don't want you to forgive me. That would only make it worse. All I want is to try and help. Try and make a difference. Pay her back. I feel I owe her that much. By the end of Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2, the uniting factors that help our heroes defeat the Dark Lords is love. Love saves the Force, and it saves the galaxy. Love helps overcome trauma. Love avoids blanket statements of evil or bad in places where it doesn't help. Love can even help you find your faith once again if you lose it. KOTOR is more than a simple action-adventure story. It's a story about moving on from the trauma of war. I hope I've illuminated to you what I think makes these Star Wars stories so special. And maybe I can convince you to consider playing both of them. This video couldn't possibly cover every single thing I could say about them. Very few games have done as successful of a job at conceptualizing matters of personal weight to actual game mechanics. While we may take it for granted nowadays, at the time, these games were truly remarkable in the sense of kind of tricking people into learning the virtues of empathy. Choices are relatable and personal, making the galaxy far, far away feel incredibly close to home. The decisions in these games give us a moment to take pause and perhaps find the light in ourselves. KOTOR shows us that redemption is within reach for people you may never suspect, underscoring a powerful idea that it's never too late to turn towards the light. And it also shows that compassion isn't a weakness. While The Sith Lords is a story filled with dark and dreary undertones, I believe it is the presence of these undertones that makes the meaningful, hopeful part of it stand out so well. Just as Nietzsche challenges you to transcend beyond simple binary, KOTOR wants you to take a serious look at right and wrong and how you personally define it. Star Wars is a world filled with deeply personal stories, and that's what makes it work. As it exists, 
it's an extension of many shared commonalities we hold dear in terms of the constant battle between the powerful and the powerless, but also our profound search for purpose. It contextualizes the way we approach spirituality, politics, and so much more. I don't know how many people think of this stuff when they think of Star Wars. One of the most common points of contention in the Star Wars fandom is, what is it about? Is its main purpose its fun and action-packed aspects? Bravado and the face of danger with a chip on your shoulder and a grin? Or is it dark, brooding, and moody with little time for casual manner? Deep, gloomy reflections from the center of your spine. I think it's all of those things, and everything and everywhere in between. I don't think Star Wars is about one particular thing, because Star Wars is about you. Knights of the Old Republic has official versions, but Revan and the Exile are in-game execution, genderless. They are blank canvases to project your stories onto. It's a story meant for you. It has moments of despair. So Damn you. And levity. Oh, ouch. I think you hurt my man feelings with that one. But one thing I appreciate about Star Wars is its message of hope. It can feature the most sinister evils that may terrify you, but it also shows you these things can be defeated. The binary of the light and dark side isn't meant to limit our way of thinking. It's to help us find codes for our shared values, and to help us find the goodness in them, even in gray places where we may not initially think to look. We're luminous beings, not crude matter. And for things to be luminous, there has to be light.